right, thank you for that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Diane Russell. I'm from the Forestry and Biodiversity Office at US Agency for International Development. Um, I had the privilege of being here for a year uh, in 2000, 2001, so it's great to be back. Uh, I really enjoy seeing, seeing all of you, meeting new, new people and catching up with some old friends. Um, and I'm particularly delighted to be moderating this panel on reconciling interests at the landscape scale. Uh, I'm an anthropologist who's worked across the spectrum of these scales from food security to landscape scale conservation to agroforestry. And the, the, uh, the kind of discussion that I think we want to generate today is going to really uh, focus on how, you know, who, who, who are these various interests that we're talking about? What are the scales that need to be reconciled? Um, what are the mechanisms for doing those? What are the sort of underlying issues that, 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 uh, that relate to all of the different sectors and scales that we're talking about? You know, things like land tenure and property rights and governance and markets and the, the broader trends that we're seeing in society today. So it's gonna be a very exciting discussion and I really wanna prompt the whole panel to be thinking broadly about these issues and, and bringing in the audience as well. Um, we have uh, a great panel that are gonna be talking about their own particular work and then reflecting not only what, on what's, what's happening today but the potential for future, um, for future endeavors and for future success in this area. And we're gonna start off the panel with a presentation from Zhao Ting Ho. Zhao Ting is uh, very dear to me because she came and helped us out with our uh, uh, forest carbon markets and communities uh, workshop in Washington and volunteered to get up and speak before our assistant administrator and lots of people. So she's, uh, she's a great person. She holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science and accounting from Fudan University and a master's in environmental management from Yale. You all know her, I guess, because she's been uh, leading the forest dialogues, forests and climate change initiatives. She's worked for numerous NGOs and bu business consulting firms in China and she's also visited many sites as part of the Forest Dialogue. So I really welcome her as the first panel on reconciling interests in, at the landscape scale and talking about the four Fs. And she'll tell us what that means. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Dan, for the introduction. and. Uh, Thanks for the organizing committee for giving me the chance to discuss with you guys some of the most pressing issues our society is facing today. And also share some of the existing body of work, the Forest Dialogue and some of our partners are doing on this specific topic. Um, since Diane encouraged us to think more broadly, let's step back and look at the global context on why we are talking about reconciling interest at landscape level. It's projected that the global population is going to surpass 9 billion by 2050 and uh, continue on the current pattern of consumption. These 9 billion people would need a lot more water, food, fuel, and fiber. And uh, moreover, we are consuming more. For example, according to the international model and the policy analysis for agriculture commodity and the trade, they find that the, there will be an annual increase of six to 23 kilogram of meat consumption per person by 2050. And that is, a lot of that increase is going to happen in developing countries. And we also face the challenge of climate change. Local weather conditions are changing. There's a lot more extreme weather conditions. And those all impact the cultivation system and the ecosystem. We are seeing more depletion of soil, water, biodiversity, and it's increasingly apparent that all these different land uses will be competing for the limited space and the natural resources we have on Earth. And we're already seeing those competition at a really intensive level, especially in those growing economy, including China and Brazil. This is a, <laughs> this challenge is actually multi-scale, multi-stakeholder, multi-sector in nature. 
And it's a really complicated question. And we, it involves asking ourselves, what do we think is the path that the humanity is going to take and should take? And we also need to challenge ourselves about some of our worldviews. So just stepping way back and thinking about the big picture. Can we do it all? Can we save the polar bears, stop deforestation in Amazon forest, and provide food security for all? Or is it too idealistic? Should we step back and think there will be trade-offs? So if that's the case, how you make compromises, how you map out those different interests, how you prioritize the different interests, what are the models that we have to do that? Is incremental changes enough to address this challenge at hand? And if it's not, do we need drastic shift in the society and the business model that we have right now to make the humanity survive this type of different challenges I just mentioned? And is it in our human nature actually to have those drastic shifts uh, unless some big disaster, big disru disruption in our society actually happens? Is globalization going to help us distribute the limited resources we have among different places more efficiently? Or is it going to actually concentrate more power, create more superpowers that would undermine social justice and equality? So whether we should have actually more localized market, looking at how rural development can be factored in, and to in encourage more scaled up localized market and the localized consumption patterns. But how are we, go are we going to do that when the vested interest and the business model right now is increasingly more international. Assume that we solved all these problems, there's also a lot of practical issues we need to address. So looking at the supply chain, we need to think about all along the value chain, how you actually uh, manage this integrated approach. How do you reduce waste uh, all across the supply chain? On the, and on the production side, as uh, Francis mentioned yesterday, is land use intensification technology actually going to lead to land sparing? And uh, if you apply the intensification technology and the models, does it mean monoculture? Does it mean more appliance of chemicals and all these different ingredients? And then how do you avoid some of the environmental and the social harms? What does the integrated and participatory land use planning really mean and how do you do it? The, um, and the, under this category, we also need to think about some of the issues we have been working on for decades, land rights. How do you have a meaningful participation based on land rights? How do you look at some of the invested interests and the current model of top-down land use planning and include more local stakeholders' decision in that? And the, what about ecosystem services? How do you include ecosystem services in your decision-making process and engage other stakeholders? And all this, uh, again, it's a really a lot of um, invested, a lot of issues that we haven't, we have been working on for a long time, but will this integrated thinking and this new model of landscape approach that we're promoting here provide us a new push to look, think out of the box and create more synergy and a political will to make those big shifts um, happen. And on the consumption side, you're also looking at consumers. How do you actually drive big change in the consumption pattern for sustainable land use? We, is it really more efficient to educate the consumers or is there just way too much information there and this should be a pre-competitive issue and you really need to go back to the supply chain and look at the big retailers and actually push the issue back to the producers, think about it, whether they can only produce sustainable goods for the consumers to use. And then um, again, coming back to the problem of globalization, international trade, how do you prevent the race to bottom when all these different countries have different standards on land use? And how do you address issues that was raised yesterday about when the Chinese consumers, the, the demand from Chinese consumers for soybeans is actually driven deforestation in the Amazon? So all these complicated <coughs> questions really push us to step out of our comfort zone, transcend the traditional way of land management, and I think what we really can do into, uh, with different partners and uh, with different sectors. And there's already a lot of existing models, tools, projects that's out there, and then we already he heard some of the projects this morning. 
Uh, I just want to give some quick examples of what we have learned through our, the Force Dialogues work on what are the existing initiative that's out there. There are already some of the models that can help us conceptualize some of the complicated problems. For example, there's a, um, a science model called the complexity science. This is basically a drip arising from the chaos theory and uh, a lot of more work has been done on it, um, done on it since the 1990s. But it's really just looking at the, the section of actions and the relation between different component factors and how they actually react to each other in a more complicated world and which is actually the reality world. And uh, there's a lot of computer modeling and the mathematic modeling technique that's out there help us to map out this type of complicated relationship and the causal relations between these different things and uh, try to find um, practical solutions for different issues. And there's also industrial ecology, and uh, um, someone mentioned about the political ecology this morning. This is also um, right, recent from the ecosystem flow and uh, how you look at reduce, uh, reuse, and recycle within different industry players, how you help them map out the material energy flow to reduce their impact, but to actually optimize the outcome and provide the environment. Why can't we actually map out the material and the energy flow between different land use production systems and think through how we can op optimize outcome and bring in the social element, what you can leverage between these different stakeholders on a landscape scale and help them optimize what they use and reduce, reuse, and recycle. And and all these different models are supported by ever more accurate GIS um, technologies. And we're not really talking about the technology only the educated and the educated scientists can use. There's also, um, I would encourage everyone, I'm running out of time, but I would encourage everyone to look at the extreme citizen science project run by University College um, London. What they're doing is they're looking at how they can actually produce science that can be used by the majority of citizens. And when we were in DRC Congo, we actually saw a successful project where the local village people can use the image-generated GRS system in a remote forest and record whether they have been consulted, what are the social activity that's going on there, and what, what's happening with the forest. So there's a set of data they can actually record by themselves and then upload it to the greater internet, and then you can look at that at a more national level, regional level, and the international level. And there's also principles and the voluntary standards. As in the opening speech mentioned, there's a lot of different sector, sector, uh, sectoral um, guidelines that's already there. Um, and the WWF is working on a project to look at how they can harmonize this different standard and voluntary guidelines in those different sectors and make it a more landscape level guidelines and help people to think through that how they can work together according to those principles and the guidelines. And the Global um, Forest Restoration Partnership, they have already come up with 10 different principles that you need to follow when you implement a landscape approach. And, and I, would in, I wouldn't go into details with those, but I encourage you to look them up on the internet. Um, and there's a lot of implementation tools and projects that we have already heard. This is a private sector driven uh, approach to look at how biodiversity corridors, water co conserv conservation, and the different, um, different land uses can be combined into the plantation system. And we also, this is, this is FAO, Developed Economic and Ecological Zoning, where they bring different ministers working in agriculture, forestry, and the environment together and they use different sets of data and they come up with the integrated land planning blueprint. And also, um, the C4 has done uh, uh, quite a lot of work on the synergies and trade-off between biodiversity conservation and local livelihood de development across the continents. Uh, the Forest Dialogue and the Growing Forest Partnership have um, recently released a guide on investing in locally controlled forestry, which is based on 17 different case studies and uh, three years of engagement process across seven countries. 
this is really a guide to understand how we can scale up um, the small holders forestry enterprises. And a lot of the principles actually apply to more integrated land use models and also small farmers operations. And uh, as Francis pointed out yesterday, it's not really the problem that we lack information and tools to develop this integrated approach. One of the biggest challenges is actually communication. There's a lack of communication between the forestry and agriculture sectors. And this is not only, only applies in the government agencies. We also see it in private sector. We see it in NGOs. Even in one organization, our own institute, there's always different scientists on marine, different scientists on forest, and they sit in the, the same building, but they may never talk. So we really want to create this platform to encourage this engagement, to bridge that gap, and to support more evidence-based research to unlock some of the key challenges and to share more information widely with different stakeholders, to communicate some of the scientific findings to different stakeholders, and to make sure that they can understand some of the practical ways forward based on those research. Um, and, uh, and this is basically ut utilizing a dialogue model that has been perfected over 12 years of experience. It's stakeholder driven, it's really um, aimed at resolve conflict, develop trust, and then has been proven that can moti motivate collaborative outcomes and uh, practices. Um, I won't go into more details about that, but I, I encourage everyone to come to the workshop um, operated by Gary Downing, the executive director of the Forest Dialogue, and he will walk, walk you step to step through this model. And we'll, to date, we already done a, a expert dialogue in Washington, D.C., and a, another dialogue in Brazil where we look at three land use models. And uh, uh, some of the findings that I shared here is actually come from those dialogues, as a result of those dialogues. And we've been seeing, especially in Brazil with the different three land use models, despite the different history, their different objectives, and their different uh, land use types, we found that integrated approach really help optimize the outcomes for the, the landowners, either it's for profit or for personal pleasure. And uh, we will have some of the summaries of from those two dialogues outside, and uh, you can grab them on your way out or find them on our website. Um, uh, to end with, I just want to mention that really the integrated solution start with you. You can really start to talk to your classmates who di study really different area from you, but th those conversations usually stimulate a lot of new ideas, and uh, you can try to work with your classmates who who are from SOM, who are working on water issues, and who are working on agriculture, and to understand how they approach different things, and then even pos possibly start a project with them. So that's basically um, end my presentation, and um, I welcome any of your comments on some of the challenges I have listed, and uh, um, I, I ask any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Zhao Ting. I think we'll just take a couple of questions. Yeah. Come on, folks. She, she laid out a huge agenda there. <laughs> Is anyone going to rise to the challenge? OK, well, we can move on. Maybe, maybe questions will come up um, during the discussion period. Uh, okay. Now I want to introduce Jeff Stoic, who, who kindly reminded me how to pronounce his name. I appreciate that, because we haven't met before, but welcome. He's a doctoral student here at, at FENS. Um, his research is focused on the politics of large-scale forest restoration in the Brazilian Atlantic forest. He's a Cullman Fellow in Tropical Biology at New York Botanical Garden. Couldn't be related at all to Chuck Peters in that, could he? Um, and he's a fellow with the National Security Education Program. Glad to see he'll be joining us in the USG, in the US government soon, at the State Department as part of his Bourne Fellowship. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Diane, for the introduction. Uh, and 
Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this great conference. I've been on the other side of the podium uh, in years past, and these folks are doing a great job. Uh, I also want to note that while I'm <clears throat> still in the early stages of my dissertation writing process, uh, this year's conference theme seemed like an ideal opportunity to, to discuss some of the merits and demerits, as I see it, of recent changes in uh, the Brazilian Forest Code. Uh, Brazilian Forest Code is federal legislation that governs the amount and type of forest cover required on all private property across the country. While still subject to uh, additional veto by the president, the majority of the revised version of the Forest Code became law last May, virtually on the eve of the Rio Plus 20 conference. What was approved was the result of 12 years of debate in the Brazilian Congress and Civil Society. How do we do that? Oh, sorry. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> now, the debate was very polarized with, on the one hand, the so-called ruralists or agriculture lobby uh, arguing for food security at home and the ability of Brazil to meet foreign demand for agricultural exports, and on the other hand, the environmentalists who argued for preservation of forests for biodiversity and carbon sequestration, for example. The environmentalists argued for a vision of the future for Brazil where increased efficiency of agricultural production could meet such demands, yet also spare Brazil's forests what they called a 21st century vision versus what they characterized as an outdated colonial era mode of predatory agriculture. The debate continues to simmer today as details are worked out even as the new law takes effect. In the next few minutes, I'll outline the basic issues at play in both the old and new legislation and how they align with a subset of my field research findings on small scale farmers, uh, small -scale farmers in Brazil's coastal forest. Now, Brazil's divided into six major biomes or macro ecosystems. Amazonia, of course, in the upper left-hand portion. Uh, the Mata Atlantica, or the coastal Atlantic forest. It's the central savanna, the semi-arid scrub forest of the northeast, the Pantanal wetlands of the southwest, and the pampas grasslands of the extreme south. This is relevant due to the fact that the forest code, both old and new, varies in its requirement of forest cover depending on what biome the property's in. These biome-specific mandates are called legal reserves. In the Amazon, it's 80% of all private property that must be under native forest cover. In the Cejado, or central savanna, it's 35%. And for all other biomes, it's 20%. Another major feature of both the new and old forest code is that of what are, so, what are called permanent protection areas. Uh, designed to protect areas on a given property that are rich in biodiversity or particularly susceptible to erosion. For example, hilltops, mountaintops, and ridgelines, slopes greater than 45 degrees, springs and headwaters, uh, riparian zones, mangroves, and coastal dunes. Now, the Forest Code of 2012, the new Forest Code, made several adjustments. And for the sake of time, I can only highlight a few of them. Uh, they include a reduction in riparian zones from between 30 and 500 meters to between 5 and 100 meters. This range depends on the size of the waterway and the size of the property involved. Another change is that certain types of cultivation are now permitted on the boundaries of mangroves, such as shrimp farming. The biodiversity rich and erosion sensitive permanent protection areas now can be counted towards a property's biome specific legal reserve requirement, whereas before that was not the case. Uh, it had to be additional. Further changes included the fact that small scale farmers that are out of compliance are only required to reforest 20% of their land, irrespective of which biome they're in, while others must reforest until they meet the legal reserve and permanent protection area requirement. The question of amnesty for those who deforested illegally was a very divisive point throughout the debate. Now, under the new law, uh, a portion of the reforestation can be comprised of permanent plantations of exotic species rather than native species. And finally, 
uh, landowners must enter their property in the new Rural Environmental Registry, uh, which facilitates monitoring of environmental compliance. Failure to do so leaves landowners subject to fines uh, and denial of bank loans. Returning now to consider small-scale farmers in particular, I'd like you to keep in mind over the last three slides of my presentation, these small properties, or minifungus as they're called, are approximately 3.4 million in number in Brazil and comprise 48.3 million hectares nationwide, an average of roughly 14 hectares per property. So while small farms represent 90% of Brazil's total number of rural properties, but occupy only 24% of rural land area. Brazil's large properties account for only 3% of rural owners, yet they occupy 56% of rural land area. Um, this disparity in land holdings is particularly interesting as small farmers, the majority of which reside in the coastal Atlantic forest, were featured prominently on both sides of the forest code debate. The ruralists, or agribusiness lobby, claim to defend the food security interests of the small farmer in trying to loosen the forest conservation requirements of the forest code. Meanwhile, environmentalists argued the other side, saying that watered down regulations on forest conservation would put small farmers at disproportionate risk due to downstream effects of imprudent land use by their larger neighbors, such as reduced water quality. However, when I conducted farm visits and interviews last year, I found small farmers, in the Atlantic Forest at least, to be largely unconcerned with the outcomes of the forest code debate, as they experienced little enforcement of the law and were unswayed by potential penalties if, if enforcement were to increase. Those I interviewed often maintained forest cover beyond that mandated by either the old or new forest code, but that being able to work more land would afford them greater security without compromising environmental concerns in their perspective. They stressed the need for flexibility in making decisions about resource management on their properties. They noted that they derived food not only from dedicated farming areas, but that forested areas also served as a source of food. Uh, for example, various fruits and uh, heart of palm was cited often. Conversely, they noted that agriculture areas provided ecosystem services such as soil retention. And many of those with whom I spoke made it clear that strict environmental legislation around the permitting of cutting native species made exotics preferable for planting. Therefore, uh, I aim to draw a few tentative conclusions based on the record of the forest code debate and the resulting legislation, as well as these site visits and interviews. Namely, one, that the forest code revisions appear to me to be more about rents seeking by vested interests, including landed politicians, than about purported agricultural productivity. Two, that perhaps rather than agricultural intensification or expansion, uh, a more equitable distribution of land allowing for biodiversity friendly forms of agriculture should be encouraged. And finally, particularly in, in the Atlantic forest, a need for agile legislation that can maximize self-determination in resource management decisions on property. So with a very few, um, with a very few quick acknowledgments, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was succinct and very in, uh, in, informative. Questions? I'll let you field the question. Okay. I, I had my problems up here. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Desi. Hey, um, well, 
I actually did not intend to study the forest code when I first decided to head to Brazil to do research. I was more interested in looking at how conservation and development were being uh, balanced in the Atlantic forest, uh, an area that's relatively understudied in Brazil, has um, a very interesting matrix of urbanization, uh, land abandonment, intensive agricultural use, uh, reforestation projects. But I think an answer to your question was just the timing. Um, the fact that I was in Brazil when this debate, this very divisive, very polarized debate was really just ramping up. And I was actually in Brazil when uh, the Senate finally approved the legislation, passed it to the president, and she did a few line item vetoes, but it entered into law. Um, so this was very much on the minds of a lot of uh, the different actors that I was studying in the Atlantic Forest. The, as I mentioned, the small farmers were aware of the debate, but were not terribly concerned with the outcomes because they saw it, at least until that point in time, as irrelevant um, to their particular interests. But since everyone else was talking about it, um, I had to include it in my research. she's going to pass you the microphone. Uh, maybe how the scientific uh, community from Brazil has or, s or has not uh, supported the, the forest code or influenced the forest code. So right. since we are here in a, in a university, so how we can, what kind of lessons can we learn with this process in Brazil? Thank you. Um, that's, that's a very important point that um, I wasn't able to include in my presentation, but was uh, very much part of the debate while I was in Brazil. Um, a, a large number of scientists, uh, conservation biologists, experts in the issues, uh, agricultural scientists as well, experts in the, the issues at hand in the Forest Code debate, uh, got together and had a very organized coalition to make the latest science relevant to the debate, available to the politicians making the decisions in the debate. Um, and there were some meetings between the senators um, and the scientists, though uh, in the follow-up to the, the congressional vote and the presidential um, decision, the scientific community was left very dissatisfied with the amount, the degree to which the science was incorporated in the final legislation that was proposed and, and ultimately approved with a few line item vetoes. So um, this gap between science and policy making is something that was a particular concern to, to those in civil society and the scientific community in Brazil. We have a very brief period of time. Does anyone have a quick question? Quick question, okay. Um, what, um, can you give an example of what scientists wanted to achieve, but what was ultimately vetoed? Like, there, are there a couple key things you can um, mention? Briefly? One example that comes to mind is, uh, as I mentioned, the, um, the permanent protection areas can now be counted as part of that total biome specific percentage. Uh, a lot of scientists saw the, the purposes of the legal reserve and the permanent protection area as distinct and therefore should not be counted towards the same goal. Um, the use of uh, exotic uh, species, non-native species in the recomposition or replanting of either the legal reserve or the permanent protection area uh, was something that uh, a lot of the members of the scientific community took issue with. Not their use at all, but their use in perpetuity. So a lot of experts in um, kind of forest dynamics and um, uh, forest ecology saw the value in using exotic species for initial replanting, but that eventually work should be done so that native species take over those particular areas. Thanks so much, Jeff. He'll be back for the panel. So let's, let's give him a hand. Now I'd like to welcome Jonah Bush um, to, to give a presentation. Um, Jonah is known 
known in circles in Washington, so our paths have crossed, um, but I didn't know that he was the lead developer of the OSIRIS suite of free online open source spreadsheet-based decision support tools for estimating and mapping the climate, forest, and revenue benefits of alternative policy decisions for Red Plus. So this is, is very exciting to, to know that, and to know that he uh, is advised on Red Plus for many governments, uh, for the GEF, and that he's published in, in a lot of scientific journals, and you still work at Conservation International. So welcome, Jonah, to the panel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's feeling very food secure after that wonderful lunch that was both caloric and nutritious. Um, some of you who are second years, second year FESers here uh, might be looking at me and thinking, weren't you my mods instructor? Uh, but that wasn't me, that's my lookalike sister, Kira Bush, who was here from 2009 to 2011. So some of you may know Kira. Um, let's see. This... Oh, we're missing the, the top. Um, can we full screen it with Control L? Or maybe we're not missing. All right. So, putting uh, putting this talk in context, uh, this is something. This is around like what Shouting was saying. We're living on a planet uh, where two of our primary uh, human goals are in conflict. So one of these goals is food security. We all uh, want to have enough to eat. And the other is climate stability. We want to uh, live on a planet that gives us climate conditions uh, that are right for civilization. And these two goals are in conflict. You probably all know this diagram from the IPCC's fourth assessment report a few years back that shows the contributions of agriculture to, uh, to climate change, both directly through uh, fertilizer application and so forth, and uh, indirectly by displacing forests. Agriculture, commercial, large commercial agriculture has become uh, the single largest driver of deforestation in the tropics. Uh, one of several natural solutions to this conflict is to shift the expansion of agriculture away from tropical forests. And there are essentially two policy approaches that can be used to do this. Um, one is price-based instruments like people talk about with red uh, carbon payments. The second is place-based policies like protected areas or uh, moratoria on agricultural expansion. Um, and what I'm going to be doing in this paper is comparing these two types of policies and how effective they can be uh, in a particular place Indonesia with regards to a particular agricultural commodity, uh, palm oil. So palm oil is in absolutely everything. It's a, uh, these days, it's, it's a fruit. It grows on uh, palm trees like this one, and it produces inside the fruit an edible oil. Uh, it produces more edible oil per hectare by far than any other uh, oil crop, it's about 4,000 4, uh, kilograms per hectare. The next largest one is olive oil. That can be up to about 2,000. And most of the other ones are far, far less. Uh, and as a result, it's quite profitable because it's, uh, a a and it goes into everything. So you can use it as cooking oil. It's the main source of cooking oil in most of Asia. Um, it goes into all these products, beverages, food, uh, cookies and candy, that sounds delicious, personal care products, cleaning products, cosmetics. So we've, all, we've, we've already used this stuff uh, you know, by the time we wake up in the morning. And you can even put it in your cars. And if you live in Europe, Europe makes you put it in your cars or in your neighbor's cars. A certain amount of uh, Europe's cars have to be filled with diesel, which largely comes from this, this palm oil. Um, so as a result of all this use, it's growing rapidly. It's currently only, let's see, palm kernel. It's this purple wedge here. It's about 3% of global oil uh, production, but it's going up, up, up every year. Uh, it's, it's consumed 
in China, in India, in the EU, uh, and everywhere else in the world in this green here. And it's produced uh, mostly these days, about 85% in Malaysia and Indonesia, and a lot of this other is Nigeria. Uh, but many of you may be familiar with tropical landscapes where uh, oil palm plantations are going in and are expanding rapidly. Um, this is a picture from Southeast Asia. This is Singapore here. This is peninsular Malaysia. This is the island of Sumatra, part of it in Indonesia. And everything that's in this, this brownish color here is uh, oil palm plantation. And this is actually an underestimate because this is plantation that's been around long enough to show up to remote sensing as, uh, as a plantation. If it's something that's been cleared and the trees are little saplings in the ground and haven't grown yet, then that's not even showing up in this map from 2011. So lots of this stuff. Uh, what, what's involved with, with oil palm plantations? Uh, primary forest, uh, a lot of it is uh, cleared in the top left here, burned and, and cleared, displacing a lot of the animals. Like in this part of the world, we've got orangutans, tigers, forest elephants, some other very charismatic large species. Uh, the trees are, are put in the ground in these, these planters here, and they grow in a monoculture. So you're displacing here on the top right a native forest that may have uh, hundreds of different tree species and about 200 or 300 tons of carbon per hectare with this monoculture that has about 40 or 60 tons of carbon per hectare. Um, so this is recognized as a problem. To, uh, to tell you about Indonesia, why, why did we choose this study area? The last speaker was asked, why did you choose you know, Brazil? Why did you research what you did? Well, Indonesia is, is uh, you know, really ground zero for both the climate uh, d debate for biodiversity and for palm oil. It's the largest, third largest tropical forest, some of the highest uh, endemism, and the, the fourth largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. And they committed in 2009 on their own to a 26 uh, to 41 percent reduction in emissions. Um, now, very, very brief summary of a very complicated land use system in Indonesia for palm oil. Essentially, uh, the national and the provincial government's zone land for what it can be used for. Can it be used for uh, plantations? Must it be conserved? And then the local uh, district chiefs are able to grant concessions, which are licenses to clear a particular area of land for a particular use, uh, like an oil palm plantation. Norway uh, and, and, and Indonesia signed a $1 billion letter of intent in 2010 to uh, begin reducing deforestation with the idea that more money would be coming later down the road uh, through a climate payment mechanism. And the centerpiece policy of this, um, this agreement is it was a two-year moratorium on new oil palm and timber concessions in primary forests and on peatland. So it doesn't include clearing on existing um, leases, but, but prohibits new leases in these areas that are very high value for climate. Uh, primary forest, you saw that, there's a lot of carbon there. Peatland, as, as many of you probably know, it is uh, very, very deep, watery uh, soil, and if you clear the forest off of it, it's like taking a lid off a boiling pot of water, and all of the gas that's trapped under there just goes up and up and up to the atmosphere, and there can be two or three times as much uh, carbon released as from the, the burning of the vegetation on top. Uh, there's, there's a few loopholes as well that have been uh, publicized. One is that there was a grace period of about a year between when the policy was announced and implemented. So if you thought you wanted to go out and get a lease, you had a year to do it before the moratorium kicked in. Also, there's some area exemptions that have caused the moratorium size to be reduced from uh, 69 million hectares down to 65 and then again to 62. So there's a map with an area that the moratorium covers and it it shrinks and shrinks. Um, but be that as it may, this is the, the very important question we wanted to try to ask with our research. If Indonesia's moratorium, as it stands, on new oil palm and timber concessions on primary forests and peatlands had been in place from 2000 to 2010, 
how effective would it have been? How much would emissions have been reduced? Um, and I had a suspicion that I'd, I'd, I'd talk a lot in the intro and, and I wouldn't uh, you know, be able to make it through all the different uh, methods. So I, I, I put all the answers here just on one slide. This is a three-step question. So uh, first of all, what was the potential scope for reducing emission reductions? Where did the emissions occur? Well, about 45% uh, of the emissions from deforestation came from either oil palm concessions or timber concessions. So this is a good place to start looking. It's actually about 10% of the land, but 45% uh, of the emissions. Second, uh, how much would the moratorium on new oil palm and timber concessions have reduced the emissions? And this is uh, sort of the, the tricky statistical part, trying to figure out um, comparing land where, where a concession was there with, with land if the concession hadn't been there. But essentially what we find with all the statistics is that putting in an oil palm concession increases the rate of deforestation by 60%. Putting in a timber concession increases it by 110%. So we pull that out and we say that uh, if those concessions hadn't been there on those new uh, places, emissions would have been 8.3% lower than they actually were over the period. Uh, about 600 million tons of CO2. Now this is, this is a lot. Uh, you can put it in context, the annual emissions of the U.S. are about 10 times this much. Um, and finally, we compare this using an, another model. This was that OSIRIS model that Diane was, uh, was introducing uh, before the talk. If there had been carbon payments instead of, of this, what would have been the, how, how much would they have been? And a rather moderate carbon price of between two and nine dollars could have achieved the same amount. Um, so my, my conclusions from this, are, first of all, even the existing moratorium is in political limbo. So the parliament doesn't want to see it extended. Much like in Brazil, they're responding to the agricultural lobby. They say enough is enough. The forestry ministry does want to extend it. Norway is considering putting up more money for it. Everyone wants to know how effective it could be. Um, but there's reasons, there's other reasons why carbon payments, a carbon market price um, could be more attractive. Or could, one, it could actually get to the 26 to 41 percent goal. Two, if you think about the political economy, it has the potential to create many, many more winners, not only losers if your land, uh, you know, if you were going to put a, 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 a plantation in, in a particular area and you can't under a moratorium with a palm oil, with a payment system, you could actually um, get carbon payments to reduce. And so you've, you've got a mix of winners and losers that could be more politically favorable. Also, a, a carbon price allows land users to make marginal decisions. It's not just plant, don't plant. It's you could decide, well, I was going to clear 50 percent, now I'll only clear 20 percent, something like that. The downside, of course, is that it requires new institutions for monitoring, uh, tracking payments, and so forth. And so that's part of the reason why it's attractive to start with something like this, a moratorium. It's easy, no new institutions. You just pass a law, stop handing out leases, and make it work. And that's pretty good. So 8.3 percent reduction, it's a good start. Thank you. Don't go away. There may be questions, particularly since it, it, you know, you're talking about carbon. So you guys must have some questions about carbon, right? Um, I was just wondering if you could explain where the one billion from Norway is going to or is planned to go to if, if not for some kind of compensa um, compensation for um, abiding by the moratorium. Yeah, thanks. And so, so Jeff and I was, we were talking last night, he promised to ask me a really, really difficult uh, question, but so I'm, I'm glad with that one. Um, all right. I was, uh, Nervous for a minute. Okay, so Nor Norway put up a billion dollars for this moratorium. They have all this North Sea uh, oil that they're, they're burning like crazy, and they want to be a good guy in the climate uh, discussions and not a bad guy. So they're, as, as you guys probably know, 
they're, pu they're, they're putting half a billion dollars, uh, or, sorry, but you know, what is it, about a billion dollars a year towards uh, tropical, reducing tropical deforestation. I've got this, this billion dollar agreement with Indonesia. What is that money going to? Uh, part of it is going towards national readiness. So that's building the institutions uh, in Jakarta and in regional governments to uh, be able to eventually uh, reduce deforestation. That includes things like uh, producing maps. They've got something called One Map, where they find where, where the idea is they would finally have, one, uh, as it as the name is, implies, one map uh, of all the forests and all the different uh, spatial layers that that contribute that, that you'd want to know to analyze deforestation. Um, another side of the money is going towards a pilot program. So they've they've picked a pilot uh, province of central. Kalimantan, uh, another one to be determined eventually, where there would be uh, payment for performance, where the, the emissions are tracked for that province, and if they go down, they'd be compensated uh, you know, on, a, on, a, dollar, on a, a price per ton basis. Um, but a lot of the money also is just to support this centerpiece policy of um, having, the, ha having this moratorium that I described. And so the payment in this case is not for the monitored and, and verified reductions in emissions as it is in this pilot program. It's a payment just to put a policy in place. Um, and so the money is going to this, uh, th th having this policy happen. And so that's why a lot of people, both in the Indonesian side and the Norwegian side, are very interested in uh, is it effective or not. And because it's just starting, we can't really measure its effectiveness uh, at least in terms of emission reductions in real time, which is why I try to, uh, you know, backcast it and say, what if it had been in place under current rules in the last decade? How effective do we think it would have been? You want to? Uh, yes. Thanks, Jonah, for your talk. Um, I have, I guess, a comment and also a question. Uh, my first one would be, I guess, the, the moratorium is a two-year moratorium, right? And so I was wondering uh, what your thoughts on what needed to be achieved within the two years, because after the two years, I guess uh, it would be as business as usual. To my understanding, the moratorium is really to give kind of this kind of a pause uh, in the business community and also the, and particularly the government to really think about what it could do to improve its spatial planning procedures. Um, you were talking about the one map. I think that is uh, that is essential. And so I don't really know whether or not Norway or the government really saw it as a way to decrease the emissions um, or more as a way to really just think about what it would want to do um, uh, within the two-year plans. And I was wondering whether or not you thought it was going in the right direction. Um, my second uh, comment, uh, a comment that I had was uh, to achieve the 26 to 41 uh, percent emission reductions. I understand it that um, the National Planning and Development Agency has actually allocated various uh, department uh, ministries for these allocations. And I was wondering what you thought, because not all of these emissions reductions would only be geared towards uh, plantation uh, and agriculture expansion. And I wonder if you knew the numbers for that um, and the other figures of how it would reduce uh, its emissions. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so the, the first question about, you know, what was trying to be achieved with the moratorium? I mean, I, I, I'm speculating a little bit, but think back in time to when this moratorium was first being discussed between Norway and Indonesia. This is, uh, you know, 2009 or, or earlier. It's pre-Copenhagen, and so there was a very uh, realistic chance that the world would come to more or less a comprehensive global climate agreement that would be involving tens of billions of dollars uh, a year going from northern countries to southern countries like Indonesia for uh, reduced rates of deforestation. Um, and so that, that was, you know, a lot of us were trying very hard to make that happen, and that was sort of the context where this moratorium was initially uh, negotiated. So, we, I mean, we know that uh, if we remember Copenhagen, that fell through. Um, but, and so now we're in this position, and, and, and if it had happened, this, you know, this would have been a really good bridge strategy of a place to start and assess whether this market is really going to happen. So now we're in a position where the, uh, you know, essentially those of us who wanted to see environmental 
payments weren't able to you know, get the politicians to deliver on that, so there is no big money. There is no tens of billions of dollars a year. There's not even really billions of dollars a year. Um, and so they, now they're assessing, do we, do we keep going with this, this bridge strategy, which on the one hand is, is not even sufficient to get to 26 degrees, 26 percent reductions. On the other hand, it's already a sacrifice that has agriculturalists pushing back. Um, you know, should, should they continue? I think it's going to depend a lot on, on whether Norway is able to, and, and able to pay and get their friends to pay uh, to keep it going. Um, the second question, can you remind me what it was? Um, it was looking at the, you know, the, there's a national strategy, uh, particularly from Bapanat, the National Land Development. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, okay. So the allocation of emission reductions uh, across provinces or across sectors. So this 26 to 41 percent emission reductions is a national uh, target, and it doesn't necessarily mean em emissions from deforestation is 26 to 41 percent, from transport, from industry, 26 to 41 percent. But my understanding is that um, if, it, if it's allocated between sectors, the, the burden for reducing emissions would actually fall more on the forest sector than it would on, on industry, on, on transport, uh, agriculture, which are all sort of targeted to be growth industries rather than, than a shrinking, you know, seen as a big, a big opportunity for reducing like the forest sector. So in, in reality, when you actually start divvying it up, the goals, the targets from the forest sector might be even higher than 26 to 41. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, last but not least, <laughs> I want to invite Peter Newton to uh, talk. He is currently a postdoc research fellow at the University of Michigan. He studied at the University of East Anglia and Cambridge in the UK. Uh, he's done extensive field work in tropical forests in Africa, South America, and Southeast Asia, so he really has a global perspective using both natural and social science research methods, so he's cross-disciplinary as well. And he's studying, uh, among other things, uh, lessons learned from community forest management for RED, which is of great interest to, to our unit, as a matter of fact, and uh, how extractive reserves can contribute to the conservation of biodiversity and environmental services while positively influencing rural livelihoods. So he seems like a very cross-sectoral person. Uh, welcome, Peter. <laughs> Thanks very much for the introduction and thanks for, for having me here. I'm really delighted to be talking here. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work, uh, some research that I'm doing with colleagues at the University of Michigan and at CCAPS um, in, a, in, a, in a project that we, that we have together. So Do you want to just tell them what CCAPS is? Oh, I'm sorry. So CCAPS is the, the CGIAR program for climate change, agriculture, and food security. So it's part of the CGIAR network, um, of which C4 is obviously also an IndyCraft also centers. Um, so I'll be very brief with the introduction because I feel like you've heard this three times in this panel already, but I guess we'll be getting the point by now. Um, so obviously uh, one of the huge challenges that we face is um, how to balance land use uh, decisions in the tropics um, with the needs of an additional 2 billion people on the planet by 2050, um, and particularly the disproportionate increase in food demand um, that is going to accompany a, an increasingly prosperous uh, population. So on the one hand, we have um, decisions in forests, and there are obviously going to be increasingly large pressures on, on remaining tropical forest areas, and yet they remain as critical as ever for ecosystem services, for biodiversity, and for forest-dependent people. On the other hand, perhaps we have um, agriculture, and obviously um, there's a, a huge demand for agricultural space within the, um, within the tropics. You might recognize that photo. <laughs> 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 um, apologies if it was meant to be credited elsewhere. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> um, and obviously agriculture is a source of income and it's a source of, uh, and it's also food. Um, it's also one of the major contributors of, of greenhouse gas emissions, um, both directly and through driving deforestation. And so a lot of these uh, challenges are epitomized or, or magnified in the commodity agriculture um, scene and so particularly with products such as soy, palm oil, uh, rubber, cattle and cocoa. Um, 
And so these are the systems that we're interested in. They're associated with particularly high rates of deforestation, and in fact, in, in aggregate, are, are responsible for um, a, a large proportion of tropical forest loss. And so just as a couple of examples, uh, soybean um, within Brazil, has, uh, soybean production in Brazil has trebled over the last 20 years, um, it, and, the, and accounts for an increasingly large proportion of the global total, so more than a quarter of, the, of global soybean now. Um, similarly, palm oil, as we just heard, in um, Indonesia and Malaysia account for more than 80% of, of global production, about 50 million tonnes in 2011. Um, although, as, as, again, as we heard, uh, palm oil plantations are now being developed in, in West Africa and, and large parts of, of Latin America as well. So there was obviously an urgent need to address um, some of these challenges, these, these conservation and development challenges. Uh, the good news, obviously, is that there's a, a huge number of um, people and organisations involved in trying to address some of these challenges. Um, and uh, mostly by, by instigating or in implementing and, and developing um, different uh, innovative interventions to, to try and alter uh, where and how commodity agriculture takes place. Um, and so by intervention in this context, I mean any uh, sort of strategy or policy or program that somehow tries to um, alter land use decisions within this, within this landscape. Um, and so, although there's a huge diversity of, of different interventions out there, we are thinking about these within three sort of broad different categories. Um, so first of all, we have um, interventions that are, are primarily based on new or unmodified institutions and policies. Uh, secondly, we think about interventions that are based on incentives, which may be either positive or, or disincentives. And thirdly, on um, interventions that are based on the development and the dissemination of new uh, information and technology. Um, and so just to give you some examples of the sorts of things I mean by these, um, and we've heard about some of them within this conference already. Uh, institutions and policies, policies obviously it might include uh, national policies such as um, Brazil's forest code, which obviously has a direct impact on, on how land use is allocated within, within the Amazon. Uh, it also includes the, the, you know, maybe in the, the moratorium on, on palm oil concession licenses within Indonesia. But it could also be sub-national policy um, or even self-regulation self within industries. Um, incentives would include funding allocated within the RED or other payments for environmental services mechanisms, or could include um, taxation strategies as well. And information-based um, in, uh, interventions um, would include things like um, consumer awareness campaigns to inform people of, or, or make people more aware of the environmental impact of their purchase decisions. Um, or in this case, the, um, this is a, a training course run in, in parts of West Africa by an NGO uh, with smallholder farmers there to make them more aware, uh, more informed and have a greater capacity to deal with the, um, and, to, and to optimize the opportunities and, and challenges that come from the spread of, of palm oil plantation within that region. And so, um, there's a huge diversity of, of different interventions out there. And so how are we to know what is the most effective approach to take within a given context? How do we know what's going to work where um, and when and, and, and why? And so I guess that's, that's an important kind of underlying question is what are the most effective strategies for achieving improved environmental, economic, and social outcomes within tropical forest landscapes where commodity agriculture is a key driver of forest loss? And so a lot of fantastic research has been done, has done an excellent job of, of, of focusing in on particular cases, on particular countries or particular commodities and identifying and characterizing those systems. What we're interested in with our research in this project is, is stepping back a little bit um, and seeing what possibility there is for um, extracting generalizable lessons from different um, systems um, and comparing and evaluating between commodities, between countries um, and across cases. But how to do that when we know that there's such a diversity of different actors, of different countries, uh, different commodities, and of different interventions involved? Um, so I guess what we think of is, is that all of these interventions essentially try to, um, to modify producer behavior, to, to modify land use decision making in, in some way. Um, and they do this either directly by targeting the land uh, user itself, or indirectly through um, a commodity supply chain. And so our first sort of step with it, within this research has been to develop a, a sort of framework for thinking about um, um, interventions in relation to commodity supply chains. And so this is a sort of highly simplified uh, characterization of a, of a supply chain. Um, and so we think of three different um, sets of actors, of different groups of actors. So we have the, actual, the, the actors directly involved in the supply chain, the market actors, from the producers 
processors, distributors, retailers, down, and the consumers. And they're obviously connected by flows of, of demand and supply. And then we think of two other sets of actors who are, if you like, peripheral to the supply chain. They're not directly involved in it necessarily, um, but it's nonetheless have the capacity to influence it. And so state actors, so all levels of national, regional, and local government, um, and then civil society actors who would include, we, we include in that category NGOs, research institutes, um, and commodity roundtables as a, as a new sort of institution in the, in the setting. And then the connection between these two, three groups of actors is, is the interventions. And so our, our policies or uh, our in, uh, institutions, our incentives, and, and our information. And so um, these two sets of actors, and indeed um, the market actors, can influence the supply chain at different, at different nodes, at different points. Um, through a, some combination of these different interventions. And so I just want to illustrate um, how we might map one, uh, an intervention onto, onto this supply chain, uh, onto this sort of framework. And I'm going to piggyback off the examples that we're already familiar with, if you allow me. So, so Brazil's Forest Code, for example, um, is a, obviously a national or federal policy. Um, and so it's designed and implemented by the state government. It's, a, uh, it's a, a policy. And it targets directly the land users. So this is pretty sort of straightforward. Um, an alternative would be the certification of, of palm oil by the RSPO, the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil. And so the, the, the Roundtable, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, the Roundtable is a, um, a civil society organization by, by our characterization here. Um, and actually it operates almost by two separate pathways. So firstly, um, by offering an incentive to producers, and that incentive being um, increased um, buying price or selling prices and access to a particular sort of niche part of the, of the market where, where you can sell um, certified products. And secondly, by offering information um, to the consumer about the environmental impact or the, the history of the, 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 sort of the, um, the supply chain route of, of, the, of the product that they're, that they're purchasing. And then those decisions obviously filter back down the supply chain um, to affect ultimately what happens on the, on the ground in, in palm oil um, producing areas. So that's just a couple of very quick examples of how we might map that sort of, um, that sort of intervention. Um, and so we, I guess we see utility in thinking about um, interventions that affect land use decision making in the tropics um, in, in this way for, for several reasons. Um, so firstly, we can sort of sit more systematically describe um, the whole range of, of strategies across different commodities and countries um, according to the types of interventions that are, that are involved. Um, and, and according to the different actor groups and according to the points in the supply chain where they, where they have their influence. Um, and so we're particularly interested in the, in the governance structures and the um, institutional arrangements that support, um, thank you, um, that support these uh, land use decisions, as, as I guess Francis was talking about yesterday. In, intervention is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You have to have the, the governance and the support to, to make them happen. Um, I guess secondly, we want to um, think about being more evaluative um, and uh, asking questions about which strategies are most effective, um, what enabling conditions are prerequisites of, of success, uh, and what interactions between different actor groups might be the most successful and under what conditions. And more quantitatively, and it was interesting to, really interested to hear the work that Jonah, you've been doing in, in quantifying or seeing to what extent we can quantify um, the impact of a, of a given intervention. So what can, what can we measure about the, the greenhouse gas emissions? Um, what can we measure about the contribution to livelihoods? reduction of poverty or, or, other, or other metric methods for, for asking or answering, for answering some of those questions. And then finally, and maybe we're a little way off this as a, as a sort of community yet, um, but obviously I guess with, with the eye on the target of um, being able to make some statements about how best to influence commodity supply chains and um, asking, is it better to target consumers or, or producers uh, and under what circumstances are incentives, institutions, or information the most effective method, um, or is it perhaps more likely some combination of those? Um, and so uh, in terms of our project or our, our interests, um, we're sort of building on this and, and trying to sort of develop some of this by creating a, or, or developing a network of different partners and institutions that are involved in implementing many of these sorts of interventions um, and in building up some kind of um, experience and, um, and, and, fr and sort of developing this framework and implementing this framework um, with them. And so we're interested in hearing from any individual or organization who is involved in, um, in um, I'll, I'll talk to you guys afterwards about uh, studying or implementing any of these sorts of uh, different interventions within this context. Um, so I hope that's given you some introduction to what the sort of work we're interested in. Um, thanks very much for your, for your time, and it'd be great to hear your questions. Thanks very much, Peter.
couple questions on this framework that he's developed? Hi, um, thanks for your talk. I um, was just talking to Jonah last night actually about how hard it is for some organizations to do internally their own work on evaluating their processes and programs and how hard it is to allocate funding for that. So I think this is really important work. I've worked in development and definitely seen a huge lack of, of really rigorous um, evaluation and monitoring. Um, but my question is more specifically I feel like a lot of that is so contextual, so how do you plan to do that on a big picture? Are you doing like some sort of statistical meta-analysis or do you have a sense of what methods you can use to do that sort of big picture evaluation? That's a sort of multi-million dollar question and maybe it's more than, than we can talk about. I mean, I guess it's, um, I, guess, I guess it comes at, at, at different levels and um, at different points, so, um, I mean, I think to get as far as a, as a I mean, it's, it's unlikely to arrive at some kind of um, statistical analysis, or sort of meta-analysis of, of, of everything. But if you want to identify a particular metric, um, such as something that's, that's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or um, you know, uh, identifying the numbers of hectares of, of forests that are conserved, or the um, impacts of, uh, of of an intervention on on incomes or livelihoods, then I think that sort of thing is um, is probably achievable, certainly within some interventions, and particularly those that are, are sort of, uh, as, as Jonah describes it, place-based, those that have a, a, a defined site. Um, and that's the sort of, those, those are the sorts of things that we're uh, exploring with our partners at the moment, um, is to develop, to, to figure out what, what the best metrics are, what the best indicators are. Um, I don't have a great answer for you right now, but um, I mean, that's sort of where we're headed is to explore some of those questions. So my question is sort of, um, Two, two pronged. Initially, I mean, if, how do you model, or if this is an open access model, how do you approach simultaneity of different projects? I mean, how do you how do you isolate projects, intervention strategies that are going on simultaneously? And then, secondarily, um, as we heard from almost every well, the middle two presenters, a lot of times the intervention sort of degrades over time, and there's some sort of there's some sort of uh, erosion of efficacy or some sort of backing down from the commitment. So how do you account for both simultaneity, backing down the commitment, or hypothetically, simultaneous backing down? So just got a little bit more what you mean by backing down? Um, well, say the overall commitment in, uh, in the palm oil example of the number of hectares or the opening of a window like a grace period. And you know, how do you account for those things? Just curious, I mean, as yeah. modeling. No, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think maybe this is something that's with opening it to a broader discussion. I don't, I don't have great answers for you. We're, um, this is really, a, I guess, develop, um, presenting a way of, of thinking about things to kind of draw them into a, into a common frame, but I don't have, uh, I don't have great answers to, to that question in any, yeah. I, I, I'd suggest that we maybe throw that as part of the open discussion. But. Sure. Hi, I'm Anna Herforth. Hi. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I think it's really important work. I, I just want to note that all those commodity chains that you pointed out are associated with really poor diets. Um, the, you know, the palm oil and the sugar and the um, beef for export, soybeans that usually go to pork. This is not food security. These are, the demand for those commodities are not about food security, they're about um, those commodities actually drive food, secu food insecurity because there of the opportunity cost of growing those for rich consumers to become obese <laughs> versus the production of foods that could meet uh, food security needs for a large number of people. So um, I just wanted to point that out because of the framing of, you know, we're talking about foods and then the need to feed two billion more people. But how, bring back the issue of diets and how are we going to feed those two billion people? Is it with commodities like this? because that's not gonna get us into a good situation for equity or for health. Yeah, no, so uh, maybe I didn't present that well. The question about how we feed two billion people is, is more about um, the fact that so much space is being taken up by these commodities and is taking away forests, which are a source of food security. I don't, I think, I don't think I mentioned, outside of the title of CCAFs, I don't think I mentioned food security in that presentation, um, or didn't intend to. Um, certainly not suggesting that commodities contribute directly to food security in any sense. In fact, they're more likely to be 
the opposite, as, you, as exactly as you as you say. So it's more to do with the. But I mean, but commodity production is going to continue happening for some time, presumably. Part of the answer then is 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 changing um, consumer uh, diets and consumer preferences. I think. Yeah, I certainly. I wasn't trying to be accusatory. Um, <laughs> I didn't think that you actually thought that way, but um, just emphasizing that that message. Uh, needs to come through because I liked what you were saying about which, you know, do we need it on the policy side and or the consumer side? And one of the earlier presenters from Forest Dialogue said the same thing. So thinking about that also in terms of, yeah, I mean, certifications so that we can, we can understand the ecological impact, but also that policy and education for consumers um, or through governments might be also about the health side. Okay, thank you so much. Let's let's have a hand for Peter. Let's let's bring the panel up. Okay, so we have at least 20 minutes, if not longer, to continue this discussion. This is a very uh, exciting group of uh, panelists, um, a huge range of ideas and approaches. We've heard about policy incentives, institutions, stakeholders, civil society dialogue, market supply chain interventions, working with consumers, communication. And I think in, the focus is really, you know, how do we get better land use decisions with good outcomes for forests, good outcomes for the environment, um, better outcomes in terms of real food security, right? And not, not just uh, a feeding, uh, making people more obese and uh, feeding uh, markets that do not necessarily need, lead to, to better, better quality food. Um, we want to conserve biodiversity. And um, we want to also, I think one thing I didn't hear so much on the panel was the importance, sort of the overall importance of good governance um, and how all of these different outcomes should be leading to better governance overall and maybe strengthening rights uh, of local people so that they can um, capitalize on any gains that are made. Um, but I have, a, I have a tricky question for you to start off the discussion. Uh, as, as someone who works for a, a major donor organization that is supporting both biodiversity conservation and, as you all know, our major Feed the Future food security initiative. So you have what we call in USAID the elevator speech. You have five minutes with our administrator. And you, need, you, you know that um, you know, we've looked at all of these different uh, options for you know getting to better land use um, better re natural resource use that's more equitable that contributes to better nutrition that has better forest outcomes uh, enhances environmental services and you have an opportunity to say to him you know to tell him where he think where where you, where should you put your resources where should we put our resources in the agency to uh, improving these outcomes um, Policies, you know, so we have policy work, we have projects, more research, we could do more research, support more research, we could uh, support institutions, we could support global dialogues, we could work on empowerment, we could look at where there ha have been successes in this area and try to replicate them. We could do, you know, visits of ministers across, you know, countries. But, you know, I guess maybe where are the really acute problems that, that need to be addressed where you have really serious, um, you know, potentially really serious negative outcomes. And if you had five minutes with our administrator, what would you tell him? Where, where, where to start? Where should he be investing our resources? Anybody want to tackle that? I knew you would step up to the plate, John. <laughs> Yeah, the Ch Chinese speaking to the U.S. government, <laughs> trying to get more money. Yeah, well, you, uh, you, you own most of our debt, so <laughs> yeah. please feel free. 
<laughs> so really pleased, actually. I, I think through all these um, conversations and the projects we've saw, saw, seen on the ground, there are a wealth of knowledge in different sectors on how to best eff effectively manage their land, but there's really a lack of understanding behind some of the values and then how to communicate it with each other. And then there's a big, a great lost opportunity there to actually more collaboratively work on a sustainable future. So just taking the example of the Brazil case that we saw three different land use models on the ground and uh, this small scale farmer which is really integrating different land uses on a, a le less than 30 hectare land and then there's a bigger tree farmer so who himself is actually trying to integrate different rotations of soybeans, maize, and uh, into his traditional teak plant, uh, not uh, eucalyptus plantation on his 800 hectare of land. And then there's a big scale agriculture guy who only believes in intensification. But all this, we, after we talk to them, the decision making, the, the thing that driven the decision making is their values, the history that came from their family, the big guy who, is a farmer for his whole life and his family is farmers. They only know about agriculture practices. And you talk to the agriculture ministry guys, it's the same thing. They only know the way that they function. And then you talk to the, you, the forest guy who does all this eucalyptus plantation. He knows about the eucalyptus plantation, but he is one of the pioneers who want to test out how to have integrated land use to maximize his profits. And then you have another smaller scale farmer who only interested in pleasure. He, in, in, he likes to drink cachaca in early in the morning and he <laughs> likes all this different type of worms growing on his land. He don't care about profit. He just want to have that integrated land use that make him happy. So just by linking that big scale agriculture guy to the forestry guy and the smaller scale guy, he now actually after the dialogue started to thinking about, oh, maybe I can use some of my land to do some of the forest because they can be my long term investment. It's just this small thing that you have link those guys to talk to each other bring change and it's not only at local scale when you actually open the windows and build a platform for different stakeholders to understand what are the value driven behind decision making and how they actually function there's a lot of interesting opportunity you can discover in how they can collaborate together so i think really it's a lot about communication pushing people step out of their comfort <laughs> zone and work together great Jonah. thanks so I want to meet the guy who has the cachaça first thing in the morning. Um, so I have two answers to your question, one very specific and then another more conceptual uh, with, a, with an example. Uh, but the first one is we are sadly at CI losing our international climate policy lead, Becky Chaco, who's been done an astounding job for us the last five years engaging with the UNFCCC because she's moving to USAID to answer that very don't question. Don't poach your people. Is that, is that what? No. Well, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. Don't pose our people. It's voluntary. I mean, she's, but it's our loss and it's your gain. So yeah. from a very practical standpoint, she is now uh, tasked to integrate climate change into everything USAID mm. does. And so that's a big, that's, that's great for you and, and for all of us uh, you know, who support the mission and, and uh, we'll miss her a lot. Um, another answer to the question is that Conservation International and USAID are partnering in Indonesia under something called the Sustainable Landscapes Partnership to, to basically attempt to address the questions, multiple questions that you were posing. And so essentially what we're saying is we've got a big ask of agricultural landscapes. We want to see food production and food security. We want to see rural development. We want to see good governance. We want to see uh, climate results and probably other things too. Uh, and, and one of the classic you know, tenets of, of policy analysis is multiple interventions for multiple goals. And so it's, it's probably unrealistic to think that there's one thing which is going to solve all of these. Rather, it's multiple interventions uh, implemented together. And so this sustainable landscape partnership, it's a, it's a partnership between USAID, CI, an environmental organization, 
uh, the Walton Family Foundation, a private organization that will, that will put a number of things in place together. So one is uh, essentially carbon payments, a carbon payment program, a red initiative that's, that's payment for reductions in emissions in uh, an agricultural frontier landscape. Two is uh, classical um, rural economic development of the type USAID has, has been practicing uh, for decades that's tailored to be complementary to a, a red program. So reducing emissions with, within one area, with, centered around a protected area, while simultaneously uh, increasing yields, designating sustainable expansion zones in the rest of the landscape. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, produce, in, in terms of increasing yields, this is sometimes mentioned as a way to take pressure off the land. I think Fra Francis mentioned before, it probably on its own, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to do the job, but in uh, concert with specific protected areas. It's definitely part of the formula. So we, we put these two or three interventions in the same place at once, backed with tens of millions of dollars, and we'll see how it goes. And if you want to hear how it's going, uh, I'm not going to tell you here. You have to talk to me over coffee. It's a long story. So you're, you're advocating a very integrated approach, sort of attacking the problem in one space with multiple interventions. For that's how I'd answer your question. Okay, great. Anyone else want to tackle that question? Or? Sure. Yeah, go uh, ahead, yeah. Peter. I mean, you've given us five minutes in an elevator, which seems like a awfully tall building, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, well, I've had. I, that I've question had. normally gives you 30 seconds maximum, but that's. True, that's true. Um, so if I've got five minutes. Pretend he's mesmerized, I'll, so he's just locked in the elevator. I would advocate two things, yeah, it just sounds like a <laughs> stuck door. Um, so I, I would advocate two things in that time. Um, I, one of them, I'm, I think Lini may kill me if you said that uh, governance wasn't mentioned very much in, in these talks. So um, I'm going to get that in now um, and say. Um, better or improved or modified governance of, of these systems um, and and certainly in investing in um, in new institutions or, or at least modified institutions that um, on the basis that what we have is, is either not working or has, has failed largely um, and so um, particularly promoting multi-actor uh, dialogues um, through whichever format they may may come through um, and secondly uh, and I, maybe I'll come back to one example actually indicates both of these, or illustrates both of these things. Sec uh, secondly, I guess, being strategic about, um, or perhaps more strategic about where we act um, and, and what we do um, to try and, if not take the lowest hanging fruit, then maybe at least make the largest gains for the least, um, you know, for, for the most, sort of, for the least cost, I guess, whatever you measure that by. Um, and so, I mean, one example is to the data that, that, um, that Jeff uh, put up about the distribution of land, of property sizes, right, within Brazil. So you have 3% of Landowners owning 56% of of, 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 the, of the land in mm. I guess it was the Brazilian Amazon. Um, so if you so you can target all of these smallholders, but even if you could convince all of them to do something differently, you'd only made you know a, a tiny sort of slice into the pie. If you if you um, find strategies or policies or whatever it is to engage with those with that three percent, then suddenly you've made a huge difference for um, engaging with with a, a fewer number of, of actors. In the, um, and I guess uh, one example from from Indonesia. Uh, a, an intervention that we've been working with. Um, there's a, the second largest palm oil company in Indonesia, um, Golden Agri Resources, have um, entered into a, a, a sort of a new um, uh, forest conservation policy um, that, that was sort of brokered between uh, TFT and Greenpeace, um, triggered initially or, or whatever, I guess, by um, a fairly sort of um, relentless uh, public awareness campaign by Greenpeace, but that eventually brought um, GAR to the, to the table and have brokered this, this new sort of forest policy, which at least on paper um, exceeds the, the expectations of the RSPO and of, of um, uh, and of, of national policy, and so and that's it. So that's you know their their, their combined area of oil palm plantation is is huge, um, and have obviously a lot of leverage within the industry. Because if you see the big guy leading mm. the way, then maybe others will will follow. So I guess um, that's sort of a strategic decision about who you um, engage with or target, um, and and how. Jeff, did you want to? Yep. Uh, I recognize it's a little bit self-serving to say, but I think uh, funding for livelihoods research, particularly um, in the Atlantic forest, just that thin little strip along the coast in Brazil, uh, you find kind of a staggering diversity uh, in terms of 
uh, culture, ethnicity, uh, ecological heterogeneity, and these all play into the the factors, the the stakeholders that that you're bringing together. Um, and so I think to try to understand the interface of, of culture and ecology a little bit better in, in some areas would be incredibly useful. And then um, to create a forum, not just for stakeholders to get together, but to have uh, the ear of policymakers and, uh, and folks that really are, are making these, these decisions that, uh, that affect um, regions of the country, uh, the country at large, and maybe international policy. Great. Um, before I open it up, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I didn't hear um, that were that came up in our workshop last week at, at U, uh, that USAID sponsored on community-based natural resource management. It was a very good workshop if anybody's interested in getting the proceedings of that. Um, and uh, it brought up um, really large-scale land use changes that have happened in some cases as a result of project interventions but really took off on their own without a lot of these things that we love to do because we're donors or policymakers or researchers you know one one that uh, that comes to mind is uh, the land care movement in Australia which is farmer farmer led natural natural resource management and environmental management I mean, it did get adopted by the government, but it was very much a grassroots movement that spread to the whole country and then to New Zealand and then to the Philippines. And then when I was at uh, World Agroforestry Center, we brought it to uh, East Africa. So it's a movement. It's not a policy. It's not a project. Another one was the conservancy movement in Namibia, um, Nepal Community Forestry, and then finally this regreening of the Sahel, which I'm sure many of you you have heard of, which you know did get some policy and project interventions, but really spread from the grassroots just as a result of a simple policy change of making um, uh, making it possible for people to own trees, where in the, whereas in the past they could not own trees, and so there was a huge perverse incentive there. So I just want to lay that out that I, I I think you know it's great to have money, it's great to do research, but we also should be thinking about what people are doing on their own in the grassroots, what civil society does and need, needs to do to make these things happen. Um, now I'd like to open it up to the floor, yeah. And try to, uh, I mean, you. I don't want to preempt your question, but I'd really like to have questions that would engage the whole panel and get them talking to each other. Thanks. So I think my question is, uh, what is the role, how do you see the role of the private sector uh, on this issue, for instance, if I have like five minutes in the elevator, I will definitely uh, put some effort trying to convince, um, no, trying to put some effort towards the private sector because I think they can play a very crucial role. So public policies sometimes they take a lot of time to be implemented. And if, for instance, if we think about the soy supply chain, there are only, I don't know, four or five traders in the world, they are in the whole world, wow. is ADM, Bungi, Cargill, Dreyfus, and some others. So if we get the commitment of them to a responsible production or with the palm oil, I, I, I don't know uh, what are the companies, but I think that's very, that could be very strategic. So my question to you is, how do you see the role of private sector on, on achieving a more sustainable development? or? Oh. Since the force dialogue was established exactly actually to bridge the private sector and the NGOs and it was first started in the forest sector and we, we, we did that especially because we realized the critical role that the private sector actually play in this policy realm and uh, just need in the reality sometimes the politicians do react better to private sector interventions than some of the, the NGOs and scientific research. It's also just a sad fact, but then we also are thinking more of the ways that we need to communicate better to the politicians. But in reality, private sector has the strongest pull right now. And then there's a, a lot of 
different things that we are looking at with the 4F partnership we are trying to create. And one of the biggest things we are also trying to get in not only the forest private sector, which already is quite um, actively involved with our network with NGOs and the government and the other different organizations under the, for, um, the forest dialogue network. We're also reaching out to the agriculture um, private sector and looking at how we can actually leverage their power because the, the key first step is actually to identify how you can attract them, the private sector, to be in your network, to have the incentive for them to understand better, for example, the agriculture sector, understand better how the forest sector is, is acting. And uh, frankly, the, the reason that there's not that much private sector involvement from the agriculture side is that there's a lack of incentive for them actually to reach out. So we, we are working with our partners really to find that the leverage that we can get the private sector to act. So I think that's actually more difficult than just thinking about how the private sector can um, act to change the supply chains. More difficult to identify that point that you actually leverage them to work with you. Um, but uh, having said that, there's a, a lot of, uh, I, I think there's a new, uh, encouraging sign that the agriculture is reaching, private sector is reaching out, and there's a new members to the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. There's more agriculture companies that has joined. So slowly and slowly, we're seeing the movement towards the, the private sector reaching out. And I also um, encourage you to read a book called The Timber. It's looking at, the, in the private sector side, who in the private sector you, are, you actually uh, look at and the leverage first to be more effective because you have private sector producers, suppliers, and all the other different um, people um, producing different services and the products. So, so the, in the book, the conclusion is that you need to actually target the retailers. The big retailers are like IKEA, like Walmart, because they actually have a wider cast off a network to different producers. So if you target them first, there will be a chain of action along a lot of producers in different countries. And those big retailers actually has a huge linkage with government and the economy. For example, in China, IKEA, IKEA's production in, uh, and the sales in China. So this type of linkage from the private sector and the, uh, find their incentive and find out who you actually um, Inference first is actually the first question I think we need to answer. Um, so I'm a little bit out of my expertise because I don't work on this, but I have colleagues that do. And, and what, what they say is to look at something called the Consumer Goods Forum, which is uh, an industry group of some of the biggest uh, retailers in the, in the world uh, across industries. This is, you know, McDonald's and, as you mentioned, Walmart, Ikea. I mean, the big ones controlling hundreds of billions of dollars of trade. Uh, and they made a commitment that by 2020, their supply chains for four or five commodities would be completely free of deforestation. So this is beef, soy, oil palm, uh, timber, paper, I believe. Um, and so this, you know, if it happens or if they even try to make it happen is, is going to have big effects on deforestation in the tropics because this isn't one little niche company saying, you know, we'd like to, to source from, uh, you know, a village where, which, which meets our, our standards of certification. Uh, th this is, you know, large percentages of the entire export of countries that, that if they're going to sell to this group has to be uh, without deforestation. And so you, that means you get interventions at the scale of entire countries, like, as I understand it, in the, the Brazil soy moratorium, which has been one of the big reasons why Brazil's deforestation has fallen more than 80% from its high about a decade ago, was because uh, the Brazilian government said, uh, we've realized this is a problem. This is the southern Amazon now, the, 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 the Mato Grosso, a little bit different than where we were looking at before. Uh, we're going to monitor every farmer's fields uh, by satellite. If they expand, you're, you're, you're cut off from the access to market, the rural credit. This is a subsidized industry. Uh, and so deforestation gone down, 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 down. They did that because of the pressure from their, their buyers. 
Uh, and the buyers did it because they faced the public and the public was saying, we don't want deforestation in the products that we're buying. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the, 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 that's kind of the, the elevator pitch, but you know, please go look at that forum and see what they're doing and, and see if that sounds right. Just want to mention that we're already involved in that. We were talking about that at lunch, and the key question there is going to be, you know, who defines deforestation and net deforestation and even, you know, what the result is going to be and the winners and losers and all of that. So it's going to be really important to pay careful attention to how that's framed. But did someone, yeah. do you want to? To, to yeah. follow up somewhat on Jonah's point, and it doesn't speak precisely to your question of how to engage the private sector, but uh, I think in the context of the forest code and this this, de uh, this debate that's been going on for 12, 12 years now resulting in the new forest code um, was largely seen to be initiated by an increase in uh, public concern in Brazil and therefore uh, certification and, and concern on the part of lenders, particularly the Brazilian National Development Bank, um, that they're giving agricultural credit only to rural uh, landholders that are not deforesting. And so then that led the agriculture lobby to um, take an interest in watering down the, the forest code. So um, there are some unforeseen um, impacts of, of these particular mobilizations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have a huge amount to add. The, the, the um, the other panelists did an excellent job of answering, but I, but I completely agree with you. I think um, engaging the private sector is critical. Um, I guess maybe the one thing that hasn't been mentioned so much is obviously the emergence of the, of the commodity roundtables. Um, their progress towards certification has not always been as fast as, some, as, as we might have liked, but I mean, um, but obviously it can get there if you sort of look at FSC or something, which is obviously you know, super well established now. Um, so perhaps they, perhaps they have a good trajectory. Obviously, you know, it's, it's working better in some places than others, but... Very quickly, okay, because yeah. we'll, uh, I want to leave time for one more question before yeah. we. One other thing is also like for researchers and the people who is working with the business model, just look at how you switch the material production to more service centric private sector business model that actually make profit. Like switching from producing paper to how you actually interact with people, the paper company can maybe actually have more advanced way to provide services instead of a material. So that would actually have a quite transformational change in the consumption patterns for people. So that's something that the researchers and the private sector can look together. How to move from material econo economy as we have now to a more service oriented one. Yeah, good point. Okay, Jacques, do you wanna one more question. Yes, so you better make it good. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, if it's good, but it's big. <laughs> it's big, okay. Um, so this is a scientific conference. Uh, we are committed to science. We love science, and at least Jonah loves science. <laughs> <laughs> from and Union of Concerned Scientists. They're, they're available from, from PIPA. <laughs> and um, Peter proposed... A, very sophisticated model, open access to put, you know, um, all the science that we can use, you know, to address all those issues together. But don't we actually already have this model? Um, maybe not in a computer, but in the brain of a series of people. I mean, if we put a bunch of people committed to these issues and having their own expertise around the table and they argue and they make decisions, isn't that your model running? But then, how to transfer that to policy? So, is that all about science, or is it about politics, but mm. politics in the wrong way? So, once we get the science, where do we get? Uh, should, we be, should we be scientists? I mean, politicians, they don't uh, run this model. They defend some particular interest of groups of people who are going to lobby with them. So, how do we shift from the good science to the good politics? Should we be scientists, do more science, or should we be activists, getting the science which is already there and pushing it on the agenda? Should we do both? Should we combine the two things? I was actually gonna ask a very similar question, so it's a good, it's a hard one, but particularly since we do love science. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we, we love science. I've been told there's a lot more of these pins if anyone wants this. Um, yeah, so I can speak a little bit of the role that uh, I've tried to play for the last five years as someone, as a scientist in the science division 
of uh, a, a non-governmental, environmental, mission-driven organization. Um, and so I had the, the privilege to be involved with the UN climate negotiations and the, some of the decisions taking place in Indonesia and in other tropical countries. The role that, that I've, uh, I've tried to, to play is to, to help a decision maker answer what will be uh, the results of this policy that I'm considering. Or I have a goal, there's multiple approaches that could get me there, what, are the, uh, what, what will the results of that be? And so there are certainly many people around the table uh, discussing, all, all very knowledgeable, uh, but w w what I've seen, you know, the, the reason I feel I have a, have a place at some of those tables would be to give this answer like 8% emission reductions. You know, you, we're talking about this moratorium, lots of pros, lots and cons from, you know, all, all sorts of, of things. But if someone wants to know, is this going to cut emissions, uh, you need uh, a model for that. And the model should be based on the, the soundest possible science. Uh, and sometimes it exists. And so, you know, a consultant can just take an existing model and run it uh, and give an answer. And that happens a lot. But sometimes the, the models don't exist. And so somebody has to uh, build the models to be able to answer that question uh, that, that's on the minds of the decision makers so they have, uh, you know, can make an informed decision. And in, you know, in our country where we're privileged, we have all these universities. There's, it's, it's, lots of universities can do this. Governments have research centers. In the countries where we work, oftentimes uh, those resources are fewer and they're in higher demand for other things. So we're able to, to provide a service by doing some of this public policy modeling to, to make informed choices. So that, that's how I, I see our role as scientists within a mission-driven organization in the field of essentially reconciling f forest climate agriculture goals. Any other quick reflections on that issue? How do we, maybe how do we use science? I mean, maybe just, I completely agree with Jonah and maybe just to back that up by yeah, saying that I guess I mean, sure, yeah, we're all scientists, um, but a scientist can have many faces, or rather several different scientists have different faces, and I think there's, there are many different roles that we can fill along a, a spectrum um, from um, more research-oriented to more policy advocacy, um, and where we each individually fit along that spectrum, I think, depends very much on our own interests, our own strengths, um, and the institutions within which we work. So I don't think there's any one clear answer. Yep, and um, just... Quickly again, like I feel like the dialogue model that we've been doing um, for the for for 12 years has been quite effective actually to act, sit down the politicians and the scientists, people who speak really different language, and actually have them actively listening to each other and understand where they come from instead of just reading from a scientific paper. So the power of actually uh, the real dialogue is quite powerful here. And then just starting with even the students here, we're in academia, we're learning in a university, but some of the classes can really be designed to help people understand the different language we use as a the businessman, as a politician, as a scientist. So um, to that end, I also want to encourage everyone to come to the workshop we are conducting this afternoon because we are talking about new class we're designing exactly to um, help people understand the different language in different sectors. Can I just, okay, I, I'm, since I'm moderating, I'll get the last word, um, which, which enables me to bring in social science. Um, so, social science is part of science, so understanding behaviors, attitudes, values, processes like the kind of processes that you're rolling out is something that really needs to be rigorously studied, and then the results of that used, fed back into policy. Often we see that as, you know, people think of that, oh, that's process, you know, and they don't understand that it really is part of science. So um, let's integrate and move on. And I want to thank our panel. It was great. We had a lot of great uh, uh, problems that have been presented, but a lot of very interesting and compelling solutions. So, and thank you all for your, for, for your questions, and we'll see you this afternoon in various sessions. Thank you. Thank you.